Welcome world to Life, Love & Wellness Global, a worldwide wellness movement. I am Reverend Sandy Rogers and as the creator of this historic event, it is my pleasure to welcome you. We come together to bring you this historic event. We have practitioners, uh, holistic practitioners, we have uh, medical doctors, we have spiritual individuals. This event is so lovingly dedicated to my mother, Mrs. Barbara Dean Brown. And my mother taught me like 40 plus years ago about the importance and the meaning behind herbs. And she would always say, we don't know what they putting in those pills so you better not you know get hooked on prescription drugs and so we listened to mom but not all of us paid attention my sister bless her heart uh, was diagnosed recently thereafter with asthma and uh, she was prescribed prednisone which is a very powerful steroid and my sister actually got hooked on steroids like someone out on the street kind of hooked, you know, like on heroin or crack or something like that. And so my mom and my sister are both on the other side, living in the other dimension, but they're upholding me. And this is dedicated to their memory. So we don't want to come and uh, make you change your mind about what you're doing. We just want to provide information to you, something different so that you have options to, to choose from so that you're not stuck because the, uh, the environment that we now live in, the fast foods, the toxins in the air that we breathe and in the water that we drink and the processed foods and all of that is causing havoc on this precious body temple. So God created our bodies to heal themselves, but they can only heal themselves when they're fed and they're nourished and they're stress-free. And so the 60, uh, or so or more uh, experts that we have are bringing you this worldwide wellness movement in an attempt to share their testimonies and their information with you. So we have uh, from age 14 on up. I don't even know what the oldest age is. I think 88 uh, or something. So you see that's a wide range of knowledge that we're bringing you. And so we hope that you come and that you get all the knowledge that you need to affect a positive change on your life and uh, share this with others. Uh, it's free, it's online, and so we're just so thankful that you decided to be a part of our listening community, the viewing community, and we certainly appreciate you for giving us your time of day and your energy and your efforts to being uh, with us and to being a part of this historic event. We have pulled together people of color for you, by you, right? So we want to make sure that you understand that we too, melanated people, people with color, can enjoy, practice, and participate in some of these modalities that others have been doing for centuries and that is pretty new to our community. So we talk about Qigong, we talk about meditation, yoga, um, spiritual work from a different perspective than religion. So we talk about the spirituality aspect. We talk about abuse in the families. We talk about all kinds of subject because, subjects because we know that in our communities there are layers and layers and layers and layers of stuff that we never talk about that's causing uh, a negative effect on our bodies and its healing process. So we address it, whatever it is, and we hope that you will benefit from the many experts that we have and that you walk away with lots of knowledge and not lots of new information and that you become fully empowered to share information with others. So thank you for being with us. We love you and we bless you. And we look forward to doing this again, but thanks for being here with the first one. We appreciate you.
for all kind of reasons. Tasili Ma'at is the name that I go by. I was given that name in stages in my life. And so I have always been able to have something to identify with, to strive to live up to. A lot of times people say, well, you know, a name is just a name and there's no significance to it. And that's how we've been raised here in America. But in fact, that's a part of the forgetting. That's a part of the forgetting of who we are, where we came from, and what we came here to do. In other words, what is our life's purpose? Is it just to be born and then grow up to pay bills? No. <laughs> we came here to do more than that. But if you never take the time to know who you are, then you won't be able to know where you came from, what you came here to do, much less where you're going. So I have um, just had an extraordinary life in so many wonderful <laughs> ways, and yet my life is probably pretty uh, regular to a lot of people. <laughs> you know, I was uh, born in the South, in Houston, Texas, and um, my mom's side of the family were civil rights workers, freedom fighters. My dad's side of the family were entrepreneurs. But entrepreneurs from the fact of being farmers, of being um, domestics, and then knowing how to save them. My grandmother and her sister yeah. on my father's side um, actually owned a block in Houston in what was called the West End District, which now is equivalent in value to Midtown. They sold a lot of property there. Uh, but back in the day, my grandmother and my grand aunts just built houses. They built about four or five houses and they rented them out. And uh, my grandmother had an eighth grade education. You know, she worked in some white folks' house. And they just happened to be some decent white folks, some decent colonizers. And they, um, they gave back. They actually paid for my father to go to medical school. So after he's had gotten his degree, spent time in the military, knew he wanted to be a doctor. So he came out, scored very high on the MCAT, and was admitted to Meharry Medical School. And uh, my mother, my mother's side, uh, they said they, they were freedom fighters from way back. My first story of historical recollection of my mother's side of the family, they um, came from the story of my seventh generation grandmother, who upon learning um, that the slaves were free. This is one of those Juneteenth stories. Um, she packed up herself and her four sons that were by Massa, Massa Day. You know, he had his black family, his white family. And she was preparing to leave and he told her, you know, he didn't want her to go and all of this. And she said, I'm not staying here. He said, well, you know. Tried to stop her, she said, it'll be over my dead body. He picked up a two by four and hit her in the head, which killed her instantly. And he felt so bad about it, he left half of the plantation to uh, those four sons. That later became the city of Dayton, Texas. You know, like most black families, all my people sold the land, were tricked out of the land, uh, got hit by high taxes, and so on and so forth. So now all that remains is a park that is dedicated to the family lineage there. But um, that freedom fighting spirit came through the lineage such that my grandfather participated in, in fact was one of the organizers of the um, Black Postal Workers Strike that took place in Houston back in the um, in the 50s, I think, 50s or 60s. Um, they had to be the 50s. And because he was one of the organizers, he was never promoted. He never got to benefit directly 
from what they were fighting for, but other African Americans did. And so um, he's seen, along with a couple other organizers, signing the um, agreement to change those laws with President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson. And um, also on that side of the family, my great-great-great-grandmother was full-blood Shawnee. So I have my lineage that is indigenous to this land is still very vibrant in my veins as well. And uh, she met my great-great-great-grandfather um, while she was on the Trail of Tears. And, uh, you know, many indigenous people were very, very dark, and so they were able to pass as being, quote, unquote, Negroes. Uh, but we know the indigenous people of this land were black already. You know, and so there was that confusion. And then also, when the Asians migrated over from the Bering Strait, they mixed with the, the black people of the land here. And thus, we get the typical image of the so-called Native American with the slanted eyes and the straight hair. Um, but they're a mixture of the woolly head, dark-skinned indigenous people that were here first. So. Um, and I would also have to acknowledge many of the uh, Asian, who are also, they were Asiatic black people. I gotta speak on that too, because they were black coming from over. But you know, when you're in cold environments, the melanin starts to become uh, latent or dormant. Anyway, that mixture was such that um, the lighter skinned indigenous people blended in with white folks. The darker skin blended in with the Negroes, and so many of them were able to escape going to the reservation. So she was one of them. She had 10 children, and she was a midwife, and she was an herbalist. So a lot of that, you know, came through to me. Fast forwarding to my mom and my dad. My mom was a community activist. She did a lot in the San Diego area. She was a member of the Urban League and the Black and Brown Coalition, which was a group of, it was a gathering of the different um, activist groups, the Panthers, the US Organization, the NAACP, the, the uh, was it Jewish, was some Jewish organization that was a part of it, the Chicano Federation. Anyway, they were all together as a coalition, and my mom would have meetings at our house. You know. So I was a baby at the foot of all of that, you know, sitting at the feet of people who sacrificed their lives so that we could have the uh, blessings that we so very much take for granted now. I remember my mom having me and my little brother, she was pushing him at the stroke, but I was carrying a picket sign and boycotting lettuce and grapes um, with the Chicanos in, um, in that movement that was led by Cesar Chavez. I remember living next door to a family that was very much involved in the US organization led by Mom out of Karanga. So I met him as a child, and Kwanzaa was a very real thing for me. It wasn't um, something that we just did once a year. Being involved in community programs and things, um, it was kept alive. Yeah, it was definitely kept alive for me. My dad, he wasn't a big activist like that, but he and the other black doctors who graduated from the area, a group of them, moved to San Diego and they started the first um, black-owned outpatient surgery center in the country. It was back in the 70s. And they were interviewed by Black Enterprise and they were on the cover and all that. And it was a very powerful thing that they did because it was in the community. 
And my dad and I used to get into it because I was always reading. I was an avid reader. And I was reading books on, you know, African liberation. I read books about our, our cosmology. At that time, it was termed mythology. Um, I was very much into political activism, of course. And so my father thought I was very militant. He and my mother used to get into it because he felt like she ruined me, so to speak. Um, but we get into arguments about blackness and what our people should do. And he would say to me, you know, all of that stuff you talking about, picking up a gun, all those kinds of things. He said, all that's going to do is get you killed. He said in his rhetoric, he said the real power is, the real black power is green power, having your finances in order, having the money to make a change tangibly for people. And at the time, I didn't get it because to be militant, to be a revolutionary, you had to wear fatigues and you had to have, you know, Miles Lou, that book. And, um, you had to uh, be poor because otherwise you'd be considered part of the petty bourgeois and a part of the problem. And um, so much of, much of what my father was saying to me this was a part of petty bourgeois rhetoric, you know, um, because he and the other doctors provided a standard of living for us where we were very well-to-do. I wouldn't say we were wealthy. We were wealthy in terms of our sense of community because we developed extended family. And most of the doctor's wives were community um, volunteers, activists on that level. Um, the Huxtables. That was a reality for us, you know, because many of the doctor's wives, when they saw the Huxtables, decided to go to law school, literally went to law school. Many of them opened up their own practices, you know. So you had fathers, husbands who were the doctors, the wives who were lawyers, or businesswomen. And um, some might say it was a privileged life. I would just say it was a blessed life because those parents then were very committed. You know, they were, they had experienced segregation. They grew up in Jim Crow. So they knew what it was like to have the resources but to be denied access just by the color of their skin. They saw um, and experienced what it was like to not be able to vote, to not be able to live in certain parts of town, to just um, be in fact, my father was almost arrested for walking down the street with his sister, who looked white because she was so light complexion. Both her parents were black, but my father's grandfather was white. So, um, in any case, he was almost arrested. They had to prove that they were brother and sister. How crazy is that? You know what I'm saying? And so to live with the threat of lynching, I mean, just for walking down the street, looking, being perceived to look at white folks the quote unquote wrong way. That's a life that we know nothing about. We may look at the police the quote unquote wrong way, but they could be black or white. And we could experience being shot lynched in jail, whatever, you know, the things that go on still. But <laughs> being able to be a beneficiary of those sacrifices, those struggles, the persistence, the perseverance, the commitment, the discipline, laid a foundation for me to know that I had no choice and be sane. <laughs> you know, um, but to fight for the liberation of our people. Now, I didn't know what it was going to look like because by the time I became of age to actually be involved in anything, all those movements had died down or were underground, wasn't popular, wasn't cool. Everybody wanted to be super fly, you know. 
the afros became perms, good times became cocaine, heroin. I was consciously aware enough to see the destruction, devastation of our people, of our community with drugs, with white women, with the women's liberation movement. I'm not a feminist. I can say I'm a womanist, but never in our history before the feminist movement have black women been confused about the allegiance to our families. It was a middle class, upper middle class, excuse me, white woman's movement. In high school, I did a term paper on the feminist movement because it was just burgeoning at that point. And me being a natural woman, you know, there were certain aspects of it that seemed attractive. But as I did the history, the research, you know, they, they, they literally piggybacked off of, you know, our human rights struggles. The feminist movement was about white women capitalizing off of black women suing white men for sexual harassment, which was all about race, because they weren't really harassing their own women like that. They did to some extent, but not like they did with us. So those cases happened to be women, and so the, the white women's suffrage movement you know, just gain momentum riding off of that, as do all these other movements who want to try and identify with the, the human rights struggle that we have as people of color in this country and all over the world as a result of colonization and institutionalized racism. Now, am I angry about it? I do sometimes still feel a way, yes, because the reverberations are, are still alive and unfortunately well. Do I dwell there? No, because I've learned to channel my anger into healing salve. Because energy is just energy. Love and hate, same energy. It's just two opposite ends of passion. So to master oneself, one become, must become a master of one's energy. So how do we deal with it? How do we transform it? How do we direct it? So rather than to be destructive, I chose to be constructive with my energy. I chose to forgive, but not forget, because the forgetting is what is lulling our people into the deepest level of sleep. And although many of our young people are running around talking about they woke, let's see, in the next five years. Or was it just a fad? Did the alarm clock go off and you hit the snooze button? Let's see.